Well, have no fear. Democrats are now the party of Wall Street. Actually, they've been the party of Wall Street for quite some time. And I say have no fear because this should come as a sigh of relief for those who think that a Biden administration is going to bring in the socialists. But for those of us who want to get money out of politics, who are sick of our government being on the take, this should make you absolutely angry. Uh, But Wall Street donated more money to Democrats than to Republicans this election cycle. In fact, Wall Street gave Joe Biden and his campaign $74 million compared to Trump's $18 million this last election cycle. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, that's because Donald Trump's a horrible human being. And Wall Street, you know, the, the party of morality who cares about whether or not a person is a horrible human being or not, uh, decided that they just couldn't tolerate the antics of Donald Trump. So they had to go with Joe Biden. We all know that doesn't make any sense. Why would Wall Street give about four to five times more money to Joe Biden than to Donald Trump? Why would Wall Street favor Democrats? Why would Wall Street be favoring Democrats since the Obama administration? There was one short little sliver of time where they actually uh, favored their own Mitt Romney over Obama in the second uh, in, in 2012. But otherwise, Democrats have now taken more money from Wall Street than Republicans. Now, I want to show you This is going to lead you down a path that's quite interesting. So I want you to stick with me, whether you be whichever side of the aisle you are on. And I understand that many people feel like the election isn't over yet. That is true. It hasn't been called yet. The media doesn't get to decide our elections. But I'm just uh, this doesn't matter about who wins. Okay, this matters about uh, right now. We're just focusing on Democrats and all the Wall Street money that they're taking. Now, what sparked me to think about this and go down this path was an article that came out today from Bloomberg. And. Um, This one was showcasing here what would happen, you know, Wall Street working on on uh, Biden and his administration and and wanting to make sure that they get the people that they want in that administration. So here is the Bloomberg article says Wall Street wants to be sure Biden can keep Warren's army at bay. Ooh, you know, we know that they've been worried about Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders during the election. They said there were reports that came out saying they were just saying anybody but Warren, anybody but Bernie. We couldn't have either of those two. So this idea that they would maybe be entering into the cabinet, uh, Wall Street is saying no way we do not want that to happen at all. So this is what they're saying. You know, they're talking about Joe Biden here. His victory sets up internal Democratic fight over regulation. Wall Street has made its peace with the Joe Biden victory, taking comfort in his decades long political career in which moderation is a prevailing trait. But it's nervous about his more liberal allies, they say. Hmm. Firms are counting on his business-friendly inner circle, a group that includes longtime Democratic strategists, corporate lawyers, and former lobbyists to exert the most influence in selecting nominees for agencies like the Treasury Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission that manage the economy and police the markets. Middle-of-the-road candidates have a key advantage. They'll have a much easier path to confirmation in a Senate that appears likely to remain in Republican hands. Now, this is interesting because I think we should keep all eyes on Georgia to see exactly how much money the Democratic Party pumps into those races. Um, It is looking like right now that uh, the Senate will still be controlled by Republicans, but there's a chance it could still go to the Democrats. But I have a suspicion they're not going to fight that hard. As much as you might think that they will, I don't think they will. I think they're going to allow Republicans to out fundraise them. And I think they're just they won't make it obvious. But I think Democrats want the divided government when they've got Republicans in charge of the Senate. They have uh, plausible deniability. Right. So they get to say, well, we couldn't do X, Y, Z because Mitch McConnell and the Senate, you know, they're blocking everything. We couldn't have Bernie Sanders as labor secretary. We wanted to. We really did. We wanted him to be labor secretary. But, you know, Mitch McConnell and the Senate, those Republicans, they wouldn't let him through. We wanted Elizabeth Warren for uh, Treasury secretary. But, you know, those Republicans. So it gives them plausible deniability if Republicans are in charge of the Senate. And I so I think that's something to really kind of keep an eye out for. So it goes on here to say, um, though banks, private equity firms and hedge funds mostly escaped the spotlight during a presidential campaign dominated by coronavirus, their top managers and Washington lobbyists, many of whom donated to Biden's run, are now emerging from the shadows to offer lists of preferred agency chiefs. Oh, okay. So Wall Street, the banks... 
uh, they want to come around and say, hey, listen, Joe, we have some ideas as to who you should be putting into your cabinet. And uh, we want you to take a look at our list because, by the way, we gave you $74 million. And do you want that money for reelection? Do you want Democrats to continue raking in the Wall Street dough? If so, you need to listen, Joe. So then they say, in a nod to Biden's pledge to have a diverse administration, their candidates include women and people of color who have experience at investment firms. A number two have worked under Obama, making them a known quantity to Wall Street. So there you have it. So Wall Street's smart, and they're saying, listen, Joe, we know you've got this progressive base, and they want to see women and people of color. So how about this? We'll just give you some Wall Street hacks who are people of color and women. Because just because you're a woman and just because you're a person of color does not make you progressive. Just because you're a woman, just because you're a person of color does not make you for the people. You can also be corrupted. Corruption knows no gender. Corruption knows no color of skin. So they're going to select a group of people for Biden to put into his cabinet and to put into these positions who are going to fulfill the checklist that progressives want to see. That way progressives can cheer and say, oh, look, it's a diverse, welcoming cabinet of all people from all walks of life. So as long as they are supportive of Wall Street, keep that in mind. So uh, this really got my attention. I saw this article this morning and I thought, oh my gosh, okay, here we go. I mean, this is exactly what I anticipated, what I expected was that a Biden administration would be all more of the same. And Joe Biden told us this during the election. I mean, he was saying, look, nothing will fundamentally change and he means it. Um, so going back in time, it turns out that Democrats have been taking more money from Wall Street than Republicans since Obama, as I mentioned. Um, this one, I want to point out, this is an article from, now this one is Politico, and this is in, this was two years ago, and here it is, Wall Street shifts to Democrats. This is two years ago. Wall Street shifts to Democrats. Barack Obama in 2008 outraised John McCain from the securities and investment industry, and Democrats overall raised more from Wall Street during that cycle. Since then, the industry shifted more of its money back to the GOP, especially during former private equity executive Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. But according to the Center for Responsive Politics, Wall Street has shifted back in Democrats' direction despite all the deregulation from the Trump administration and GOP Congress. Goes on to say, why is this? The shift back to near parity for Republicans and Democrats from the securities industry reflects industry-wide discomfort with the Trump-era GOP, both due to the president's culture war battles and his trade and immigration policies. So that's really interesting. So basically what they're saying is that uh, Wall Street started giving more money to Barack Obama in 2008 than they were to Republicans. So you have to ask yourselves, why were they doing that? Probably because they knew that Barack Obama would be softer on them. They were, we had the economic crash in 2008. They wanted to, I think at that point, I don't even know if they knew if Obama would be softer on them or if Obama, you know, Obama did try, I think, with the Dodd-Frank Act, but that ultimately got watered down. Um, but still, I think they were saying, look, we can't just give money to one side. We got to give money to both sides if we want to make sure both sides are in our corner. It is smarter to give to both sides because it's not about politics for the big money interests. They don't care. They don't care about your morality. They don't care about that. They only care about their bottom line. So give to both and that way you win either way. That's the game plan for them and it's been working. So they gave more money to Obama in 2008. That worked for them. There wasn't very, we saw no real regulation going on in 2008 after the economic crisis. We didn't see anybody go to jail. We really didn't see, you know, the regulations that they attempted to put in place got watered down. Um, so what they're saying is Obama got more money in 2008 than Mitt Romney. Now, remember, Mitt Romney is one of their own. He's a Wall Street guy. So they gave money to Mitt Romney thinking, well, this guy, he's been benefiting just like us. You know, he's a billionaire just like us. He's been taking advantage of all these loopholes just like us. So they gave more money to Mitt Romney only to turn around again and give more money back to Hillary Clinton in the 2016 presidential campaign. She raised $90 million from Wall Street says here, why Republicans like Maxine Waters? Now, this is a little bit of a side note. This isn't about the presidential election, but also just Congress in general. And I wanted to read this little portion of this article to you. It's kind of a side note, and then we'll kind of get back on track. But why Republicans like Maxine Waters? Speaking of Dems possibly regaining House gavels, Politico's Zachary Wambra 
uh, with a great one. Quote, Trump has mocked Maxine Waters as a low IQ person, and she has called for the president's impeachment. But Republicans who work with the California Democrat on the House Financial Services Committee see something different, a rare dealmaker in a polarized Congress. Water, quote, Waters, who would chair the committee if Democrats win the House, has shown a surprising willingness to work across the aisle and with industry groups, even helping to deliver White House-backed legislation to ease regulations and crack down on China. So Maxine Waters, uh, this just right here, I wanted to show this to you to show that it is, it is not just, you know, Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or, you know, the presidencies, that this also is Congress, that Congress, the Democrats, raise more money in Congress from Wall Street, and that has had an impact on how they regulate or how they don't regulate. And we'll get further into that as this goes on here. Um, now, th let's see here. More things to show you. Now, this is from NPR. I wanted to bring this one to your attention as well. This is Wall Street's big money is betting on Biden and Democrats in 2020. So this is about the campaign here. It says, for the first time in a decade, deep-pocketed donors from the halls of finance are giving more money to Democrats than Republicans, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, a research group that tracks money in politics. So this has to do with Congress as well. So not just the presidential candidate, but Congress. It says here, of, of nearly 800 million donated to politicians by security firms, banks, and real estate companies and their employees, by June 30th, slightly more than half went to Democrats. So there you go. It's not just the presidential campaigns. It's Congress. It says that's important because the finance sector is by far the biggest contributor to political campaigns in the country. So now Democrats are rolling in the dough. They love this. They're lining their pockets with Wall Street money. So if you thought they were the party for the people, if you thought they were the progressive party, think again. Now, again, that might be music to your ears if you're afraid of socialists coming to take over America. But really, as an American citizen, you should be very worried that these big money interests have been able to take over our political system and that they've been able to hijack our, our government. We don't have a government for the people anymore. It says right here, meanwhile, wallets are opening faster for Democrats this election season than they did in 2016, says Charles Myers, chairman of Signum Global Advisors, who helped raise money for Hillary Clinton four years ago. For people to write a $100,000 check, a $250,000 check, that would have been really extraordinary four years ago, Myers said. Today, we're seeing a lot of that. So Democrats have made this shift. Now, I think it started off with Wall Street just wanting to buy both sides. And then Wall Street saw, wait a minute, you know what? The Democrats are willing to really work with us. They really like this money. Mm, yeah, they like this money. So they have now started giving more and more money to Democrats to the point where it's reached an epic high of giving Joe Biden $74 million and giving Trump $18 million. That is a huge difference in the amount of money that is being uh, taken by Democrats and Republicans. I want to show you this as well. This is a graph that shows um, how much money either side took from small donors versus large donors. Here this is. Now this is from OpenSecrets.org. Now you can see here Biden has a huge amount more money that he raised over Donald Trump. But the dark blue right here is the large money donors and the dark red are the large money donors and the light is the small donors like people like you and me. So you could see here that Joe Biden, even though Trump and Joe Biden have, you know, he definitely outraised Trump when it comes to small donor, small uh, donors. It wasn't by a ton, right? It wasn't by a ton. That wasn't what created the massive difference in the in the amount of money raised it was the large money donors that created the huge difference between biden and trump large money donors so there you go democrats the party for the people are actually bought off and that comes with a price that comes with um, promises a price and promises now i want to show you this article this was written by robert reich now robert reich uh, he, uh, I believe, worked in the Obama administration. He's a huge anti-Trump guy, never Trump, total, total anti-Trump guy. Absolutely was saying this is an existential crisis. We cannot have Trump in office. This is horrible, right? I want to point this article out that he wrote uh, back in 2014, back when, before he kind of got, I think, what we call Trump derangement syndrome, and when he was willing to call out Democrats for also being on the take. This is his article. It says, Wall Street's Democrats... In Washington's coming budget battle, now I'm going to read this whole article to you because it's important for, this kind of shows 
why Democrats are raising so much more money. And then it also kind of shows it'll show why Donald Trump didn't raise so much Wall Street money. And it's really interesting. You want to pay attention all the way to the end, guys. Says Wall Street's Democrats in Washington's coming budget battles, sacred cows like the tax deductions for home mortgage interest and charitable donations are likely to be on the table, along with potential cuts to Social Security and Medicare. But no one on Capitol Hill believes Wall Street's beloved carried interest tax loophole will be touched. Don't blame the newly elected Republican Congress. Democrats didn't repeal the loophole when they ran both houses of Congress from January 2009 to January 2011. And the reason they didn't has direct bearing on the future of the party. Now, remember, this was written in 2014. First, let me explain why this loophole is the most flagrant of all giveaways to the super rich. Carried interest allows hedge fund and private equity managers, as well as many venture capitalists and partners in real estate investment trusts, to treat their take of profits as capital gains, taxed at a maximum rate of 23.8% instead of the 39.6% maximum applied to ordinary income. So they're you know they're running away. They already make a gob of money, and then they're only taxed at 23.8% when you and I are taxed at 39.6%. It's a pure scam. They get the tax breaks even though they invest other people's money rather than risk their own. The loophole has no economic justification. As one private equity manager told me recently, I can't defend it. No one can. It's worth about $11 billion a year, more than enough to extend unemployment benefits to every one of America's nearly 3 million long-term unemployed. The hedge fund, private equity, and other fund managers who receive this $11 billion are some of the richest people in America. Forbes lists 46 billionaires who have derived most of their wealth from managing hedge funds. Mitt Romney used the carry interest loophole to help limit his effective tax rate in 2011 to 13.9%. So that right there shows why Wall Street took a break and said, "Okay, we'll back the Mitt Romney guy. He's one of us. And then, you know, right after that, they snapped right back to Democrats. So why didn't Democrats close it when they ran Congress? Actually, in 2010, House Democrats finally squeaked through a tax plan that did close the carried interest loophole. But the democratically controlled Senate wouldn't go along. Yeah. So they always blame everything on Mitch McConnell, right? Democrats are always like, well, what is Mitch McConnell? Is Mitch McConnell? No, no, no. This was Chuck Schumer. Says Senator Senator Charles Schumer, one of those who argued against closing it, said the U.S., quote, shouldn't do anything to make it easier for capital and ideas to flow to London or anywhere else. So he's saying we'll lose them if we do that. We can't do that. Robert Reich says as if Wall Street needed an $11 billion annual bribe to stay put. To find the real reason Democrats didn't close the loophole, follow the money. Wall Street is one of the Democratic Party's biggest contributors. The street donated $49.1 million to Democrats in 2010, according to the nonpartisan Center for Responsive Politics. Hedge fund managers alone accounted for $5.88 million of the total. Schumer and a few other influential Democrats were among the industry's major beneficiaries. Wall Street has continued to be generous to Democrats as well as to Republicans. The Democrats' unwillingness to close the carried interest loophole when they could also when they could also goes some way to explain why, almost six years after Wall Street's near meltdown, the Obama administration has done so little to rein in on the street. Wall Street's biggest banks are far bigger now than they were then. Yet they still have no credible plan for winding down their operations if they get into trouble. The Dodd-Frank Act, designed to prevent another Wall Street failure, has been watered down so much it's slush. There's been no move to resurrect the Glass-Steagall Act, separating investment banks from commercial banking. Not a single Wall Street executive has been prosecuted for his involvement in the frauds that caused this mess. Wall Street was the fourth largest contributor to Barack Obama's presidential campaign in 2008 and is already gearing up for Hillary Clinton's 2016 run. Hedge fund and private equity managers are donating generously to Priorities USA Action, a super PAC dedicated to getting her elected. So there you go. Um, Robert Reich was calling it out back in 2014 that Democrats are just really not doing anything because it turns out they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them, that they are bought off by Wall Street. So this kind of notion that, you know, oh, yay, Joe Biden is now going to be president and running the White House and he's going to have this really progressive cabinet. Now, he has promised to have the most progressive cabinet in the history of cabinets, and he will. His cabinet will be made of women and people of color. I have no doubt about that. But Susan Rice, who is both of those, is a warmonger, and I guarantee you she will be the U.S. Secretary of State.
Uh, you've got Michelle Flournoy, who is another big warmonger who really is the architect of the Bush era uh, preemptive strike warmongering policies, as well as Hillary Clinton's warmongering policies, uh, which under Barack Obama, uh, she she really is the architect of all of that. Um, she is going to probably be the defense secretary, and she's a huge warmonger. So having women or people of color in these positions of power doesn't mean that they're going to be any different than any man or you know, any white man. I mean, it's just ridiculous to think that. So I was really interested. Now, here's kind of the plot twist in this is I was really interested in this. You know, I didn't quite understand as I was reading through this. I understand the money's going to the Democrats. I understand they're on the take. I understand that, yes, Joe Biden is going to have this really progressive looking, you know, diverse cabinet, but that ultimately is on the take by Wall Street and Wall Street's making it known. And these news organizations aren't lying or, or being shy about it. Um, really interested in, in figuring out what this tax loophole was. So I went and did a little research on this tax loophole. Carried interest is what it is. And lo and behold, it turns out, I come across this article right here. Here it is from Reuters. This is from two years ago, March of 2018. It's almost three years ago. U.S. Treasury to close carried interest loophole in new tax law. The U.S. Treasury said on Thursday it will close an unintended loophole created by the Republican tax overhaul that let some Wall Street financial managers dodge new limits on carried interest by operating as businesses known as S-corporations. Carried interest refers to a long-standing Wall Street tax break that let many private equity and hedge fund financiers pay the lower capital gains tax rate on much of their income instead of the higher income tax rate paid by wage earners. President Donald Trump vowed to close the loophole during the 2016 presidential election campaign. Republican tax legislation signed into law by Trump in December required fund manager, managers to hold investments for at least three years before becoming eligible for the lower capital gains rate. But it exempted corporations. Media reports soon followed, saying that some investment funds were setting up pass-through entities known as S-corporations in the hopes of qualifying for their corporate exemption and skirting the carried interest restriction. On Thursday, the Treasury and its tax collecting Internal Revenue Service announced that forthcoming regulations will prevent S corporations from taking advantage of the carried interest exemption. So now uh, the Trump administration and the Republican Congress that did pass that Paul Ryan tax plan did not close the carried interest loophole, but they did add a lot of restrictions to it. Now, Trump said he wanted to close it. He did try. We do know that he did attempt to negotiate to close it. But, um, you know, he ended up backing down on that, which is unfortunate. However, they did add a bunch of regulations to it. And then people were saying, well, these regulations allow for this loophole. You know, so you've tried to close this loophole or at least put regulations on a loophole. And now there's a loophole for the loophole. And the media kind of uh, really pranced on that. And they were like, oh, or uh, pounced on that. And they, they said, oh, well, see, it's not real. It's, it's a fake closing of the loophole because they've got a loophole for the loophole. And then the U.S. Treasury came out and said, no, actually, we're going to limit that loophole for the loophole. So actually, ironically, uh, but is it ironic that the Trump administration did more to limit that loophole? Now, it's not closed. It would need to be closed by law. It's not something the Trump administration that he could do from the executive office. You know, it's something that has to be passed into law by Congress. And that's the problem is you got to work with Congress on this and they are an equal branch of government. Um, but it's interesting to me that the Republican Congress, when they were in power, actually put limits on this loophole when the Democrats did nothing to put the limit limits on that loophole. It passed the House. It squeaked by. There were some members of the House that wanted to do it. Uh, enough of them said, yeah, let's do it. And the Senate put the put the kibosh on that. So meanwhile, Republicans were able to get some restrictions onto it. They were able to limit it. Now there's reports out there. If you go and you research this, they'll say that, uh, you know, people, companies and hedge fund managers and whatnot, they're having to rethink this because they can't really use that loophole as, as freely as they would like anymore. So they have to kind of rethink things. And I'm sure they'll find other loopholes because they're very good at that. But I find it ironic that it was the Republican Congress and T Trump who ended up putting limits on this, at least. It's not done, but it's at least limited. And I think that would then explain why uh, Wall Street said, you know, you're not really on our team because you, he even after this came out and said, I want to do more and I want to actually end this and we need to, we need to go in and try to end this. And so 
Uh, maybe they were afraid of a second term where he actually will regulate them, unlike Democrats have been really willing to do. Uh, also, you know, of course, there's other reasons why they don't like Trump. Uh, his trade war on China is one other reason why they absolutely do not like him. That does hurt their bottom line. As they said in one of these articles I read to you, they didn't like his trade policies and they didn't like his immigration policies. That is something to pay attention to. Immigration, look, if you're the party of Wall Street, you want to let as many people in uh, undocumented into your borders as possible. Now, documenting them is different. If you agree on a documenting system, on a system of legal immigration, then those people are entitled to all of the same laws that anyone's entitled to. But if somebody's undocumented, they can be exploited. That means that you can then hire them for hardly anything. They need the work. You can do it under the table. And that is something that Wall Street, people who are in bed with Wall Street don't want to end that loophole for labor. It's a labor loophole. They want to keep it. They want uh, undocumented people that they can exploit. It's essentially a sweatshop workers. That's what they want. They also don't like trade wars because they like to be able to, uh, they don't like tariffs and they want to be able to, you know, offshore their their uh, jobs and they want low cost goods, low cost manufacturing. They want all of that. They want low cost imports. They want all of that, uh, even if it means the average American loses because the average American can't get a job, can't compete against people that are that are living in Vietnam. Uh, and believe me, I know half of my family is still over there. They cannot compete with the wages that Vietnam's able to pay their workers because not because Vietnam's, oh, just got a bunch of sweatshops, which maybe they do, but because cost of living is so much lower. I mean, if you only need a couple hundred bucks for rent, you don't have to make as much when you're comp and then if you're the guy who needs two thousand dollars because you're living in New York or you're living in Los Angeles or Seattle or wherever, or D.C., you need to make more money. How can you possibly compete with somebody who doesn't need to make that much money all the way on the other side of the world. That is the problem. And uh, that's why Wall Street was not interested in Trump anymore, but very interested in Joe Biden. So the point of all of this is do not get lazy. Do not stop and think, oh, you know, everything's OK now. And, you know, Joe Biden is going to take over and all is well, everybody. No, the rich are going to continue to get rich and the poor are going to continue to get poor, uh, poorer. I'm sure. I'm sorry. My English is a bit uh, <laughs> struggling here. Um, and that is something that we need to be made. We need to understand that that is the exact formula that gave us Donald Trump. That is the formula that has caused the rise of this populist movement in the United States. And I want to say one last thing, which I'm, I'm sure I'll do a deeper segment on in uh, about at another time. France they exhaled a sigh of relief when Emmanuel Macron was elected. You have to remember Donald Trump had been elected here in the United States. Uh, Brexit happened. And I think even Bolsonaro won his election in Brazil. And France said, oh, my gosh, we can't let this Marine Le Pen lady win. You know, she's this xenophobic, racist woman. She's all, you know, she was a populist. And they said, we can't let this Marine Le Pen lady win. And Emmanuel Macron won, and they and the world let out a sigh of relief, saying, oh, okay, at least not the French are being overtaken by this populist movement. And what happened to France? France began to burn. The Yellow Vest movement came out in droves on the streets and started to burn France down, saying, we cannot allow the rich to continue to get richer and the poor to continue to get poorer. This has to stop. And that is my fear for America moving forward, is that everybody's exhaling, you know, exiling, is that, exhale, <laughs> exhaling. Sorry, sometimes because I have uh, headphones in my ears, I can't even hear myself really speak. So, um, you know, they're, they're releasing a sigh of relief. And ultimately, um, you, you know, you, you really might reg regret what you wish for in this scenario as the rich take off with more and the people uh, feel it even and suffer even more. So that's kind of the moral of the story. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe if you like this content. Uh, you know, I am an independent progressive who really likes to expose the inner workings of what is going on in our corrupt government. So I appreciate you supporting the channel. The links are down below. I am fully independent. Um, and I really appreciate you watching this segment. I appreciate you sharing it. And I appreciate you subscribing. Thank you so much for watching.